Misandry in the News Today with Paul Elam and Tom Golden, Episode 2. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Paul Elam with The Voice for Men, and this is my friend Tom Golden at menaregood.com. And this is Misandry in the News Today, where we cover a quadrant of stories. One, two, three, four of them. I don't, is quadrant the word? How about a quartet? Quartet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, quadrant would be something else. Anyway, never don't pay any attention to me. Um, but we want to look at how misandry rears its ugly head in, in modern news stories. And this is our way of doing it. And guess what? We have no shortage of material as usual. Anyway, how are you doing, Tom? Man, I feel better all over than any place else. That's a good thing to say. You bet. It's good. So and shall yes, we misandry get... is not short in the news, man. You just open your eyes and bingo, there it is. All over the place. As a matter of fact, I had I was sorting through stories, discarding one for another, finding better ones, uh, because there's an abundance of it yes. going on. Yes. And we will start with one of our favorite subjects, Harvey Weinstein. And let me say from the beginning, you know, I I get it. You know, I think when all is said and done, Harvey Weinstein's probably a scumbag. He's a scumbag guy in a scumbag industry that's sitting in a scumbag town, uh, being covered by a scumbag media, and they've started a scumbag movement called Me Too. And so it's scumbags from beginning to end. But one of the interesting things is that you will see, if you check the stories that are linked below, you will find the first one is to the fact that one of Weinstein's accusers, one of his criminal accusers. The first one. The very first one. They found that she sent him emails and text messages after the <laughs> rape happened, where she was talking about, you're the only one who understands me. Nobody who un understands me like you. I can't wait to see you again. I miss you. You know, the typical things that rape victims say to their rapists after they've been raped. What, what do you think about this, Tom? Oh, man, I've, <laughs> I've heard for years, you know, the, the, the court testimony of these experts talking about the weird things women do after they're raped. And <laughs> I don't know, I've just never seen it, Paul. I've never seen it, but I hear them say all the time, well, they do these weird things like they say, oh, I love you, I love you. But it's like, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of trauma victims. I've never seen one pull that kind of stuff. You know, neither have I. And I, and I can tell you, as somebody that's worked in the mental health field for a very long time, especially in the area of chemical dependency, I saw all kinds of victims, both yes. of sexual assaults and of family sexual violence. Yes. And I can't say that I ever saw one who was raped literally raped by somebody that returned that with love. I, I've never seen that. I've seen it confused in family situations sometimes, but in terms of victims of sexual assault in general, I've never seen it happen. I don't believe it happened in this case. I believe what happened in this case is what most people with any sense would expect happened, that you had a woman who was trying to make it in Hollywood because, um, you know, let's face it, Har face it, Harvey Weinstein's not the most attractive guy, uh, but he had a lot of power and a lot of money, a lot of influence, could get careers going. And that was obviously what was happening, what was happening across all of this. Did. And I bet you that that's what they find out. Now, it remains to be seen whether or not that they will convict him. Um, they might convict him anyway. Because it's not, you know, what we've seen like in the Marv Albert case uh, back years ago and oh, a lot yeah. of other cases yeah. is that because of rape shield laws and because of other funny stuff going on with the prosecution, they don't let evidence in. And here's one warning sign about that. When you read the story, one of the things you'll find is one, this woman still has not been identified. She is still enjoying anonymity as all of this is going on. And two, this information was not brought to light to the grand jury when Weinstein was indicted. 
the grand jury heard nothing about this. All they heard was the allegation that she was raped. Right. They didn't hear anything about her writing about his or love and admiration for right. this guy afterward. Oh, I'm getting her mixed up then with someone else because I said she was the first one and maybe this is not the first one. I don't know if she's the first one or not. Yeah. I thought maybe yeah, that was so I take that back. Uh, she's definitely one of them. This is one of the criminal yes. cases against him. Yes. And I tell you what, if the other criminal cases shape up to be as flimsy as this, then we've got a major railroading going on. Yeah. Here. Well, you said a long time ago, Paul, I remember you said that there's two power ploys that are going on here. One is Weinstein's using his power to get sex while the woman is using her sex to get power. You know, so that's, it's like this is, a, this is a play that's been going on for decades. Yes, and it, it is a power play that's been going on. I know it's been going on since the 1920s and the 1930s yeah. were rip-roaring years for powerful producers um, taking, well, I put taking advantage in quotation marks yeah. because who's taking advantage of who? Exactly, exactly. And if you've got two drunk people having sex, the guy is the rapist and she's the victim. And if you have two people having sex and both of both people are getting something out of it other than sexual satisfaction, then you have a rape going on according to our standards today. Right. And yes. of course, the woman is the victim. Uh, but we're going to see how this plays out. I know we'll be revisiting this story, but right now, what I'm looking at is that Harvey Weinstein is innocent uh, of doing anything. I mean, he, him and, and what, a hundred other producers in Hollywood have yeah. casting couches. So he's uh, guilty of being a scumbag. Yes, he's guilty of being a scumbag, if you want to call her the scumbag. I mean, um, who knows? I mean, yeah, I think he's probably a scumbag, but <laughs> I mean, I, well, I used that, using that word rather quickly, he may not be a scumbag at all. We may just be talking about, about business as usual in Hollywood. It was business as usual. And if that's the case, they're all scumbags, which I believe, you look at the way Hollywood behaves these days, they're all scumbags. Sure enough. Crazy stuff, eh? Anyway, that's my story number one. Yeah, good. Uh, the free Harvey. Free Harvey. Free Harvey. Hashtag free Harvey. Go after it. Oh, wait, you can't, Paul. They kicked you off Twitter. Never mind. Oh, God. Yeah, don't do that. So what's number two? We're going to go Paul Tom this time. Not, yeah. not Paul, Paul Tom Tom. That's good. You Paul got Tom. number two. So what was number two? <laughs> what, what was my? Let's see. Did I, I think oh, it was something about the University of Oregon. That's thank you, Paul. In the University of Oregon, bless their little hearts, they have decided that they're going to charge students uh, for being in a club, and the club uh, is the men's club, which prior to I think two years ago was just guys getting together and talking about health-related stuff and this is and that's. But all of a sudden, the club got taken over by feminists. And so now, instead of being a, uh, a fairly uh, nondescript, non-popular sort of group, now their university is giving them $90,000 a year because they are, their mission is to wipe out toxic masculinity in the male students. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, 90 it, grand a year. To wipe out toxic masculinity. What the hell are they going to do with $90,000 to give to some club a year for toxic masculinity? Is that crazy? Well, I mean, toxic masculinity doesn't exist, first off. Yeah, there, there's, there's that. I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> there is the no, that fact that there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Yeah. Well, maybe they're going to get the whole school, all the male students can get man buns. Get, get what? Man buns. What's that? A man, you know a man bun? Oh. With a bun. Oh. With a bun the, yeah, it's, it's what all the, the super feminized guys are doing now. Is that right? They're wearing tank tops and they've got man dun, ban, buns. Um, man buns. Man buns. When I think about buns, I think about something else. 
Yeah, well, uh, you're old school, Tom. Yeah, very old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know something, I, you might look at it this way. If they're willing to wear a man bun, their buns are on top of their shoulders anyway. So yes, you've got indeed. two buns up there. Indeed. Well, Oregon, in their <laughs> wisdom, is charging each student $238 each semester for this toxic masculinity group. How about that? And the students don't have a choice about whether they pay for this or not. You know, someone said, well, look, why don't we make it so that the students can choose the ones they want to donate to and the ones they don't want to donate to, which I think would be a grand idea. But I doubt if they're going to like that so much. No, the left doesn't go that direction. No, ever. Choice only for women. <laughs> yes. Choice for women. No choice. Choice for only for women who agree with us. Yes, that's true, too. <laughs> That's true, in which case, we know the choice they'll make. So it's crazy, eh? Just absolutely crazy. They're pushing this whole idea of eliminating toxic masculinity by women running a men's club who are funded by the university. <laughs> and all they're going to do is create a bunch of beta pukes that'll never get laid. And it, that'll be that. I mean, it's... I, I'm telling you, guys, anybody at, at, uh, at Oregon, was it Oregon State or University of Oregon? You know, where was it, Paul? Let's see. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, geez. One of these years I'll find it. University of Oregon, fight against University toxic masculinity. So, guys, if you go to University of Oregon, if you know any males who go to the University of Oregon, uh, just know that you're paying for your own degradation. Really? And, and let's be fair, you know, if you're going to almost any university in the West now, in the Northern America especially, uh, you're going to be paying for your own degradation. That's sort of part of the program. But this is just more overt than others. And it does not surprise me that it's happening on the left coast. Um, <laughs> $90,000 a year. I, I mean, you have to wonder how many disadvantaged, really disadvantaged people could get an education on that money. Yeah. Um, you have to wonder, too, what they're going to spend it on. I think it's going to be on man buns and tank tops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. I guess we'll have to see. <sighs> I guess we'll Lord have to mercy. see. What's your second one, Paul? Oh, I'm going to revisit Asia Argento again, one of my favorite people, the woman who was cheating on Anthony Bourdain just before he hung himself, and who also, her claim to fame, as, as an extension of this story, was that she claims to have been raped by Harvey Weinstein and made a big deal of it, but uh-oh, what came out in the news today? I we give up. Find out that she had to pay three hundred and eighty thousand dollars to a boy she sexually assaulted. No. In California. No. Yes, it's linked below. You can read all about it. This was a man named Jenny, Jimmy Bennett, who, by the way, she met when he was seven years old. So this oh. fucking perpetrator was grooming this kid oh, from the time he was seven. Finally got in cornered in a hotel room at 17 and the age of consent. We can argue about what age of consent should be or shouldn't be, 18, but in right? California, it's 18. Yeah. He was 17. She had groomed him. She had been on set with him working in projects where she played his mother. And so there is a position above him that as an adult woman, starting with him as a seven-year-old boy, where she groomed him, manipulated him, exercised her power over him, got in corner in, in a hotel room and engaged him in oral sex and then sexual intercourse. And he said, and I'm quoting here the afterward, that he felt disgusted. He felt confused. Uh, he, he was very upset. He felt like it affected him for life, this wow. event. Uh, and again, I'm not even going to debate that. The fact of the matter is that it was against the law. And it was morally wrong because she had been in such a position, an adult child position with him for such a long time. That is not supposed to happen. But here she is, this bitch, this 
absolute lying bitch saying she's the rape victim. Feel sorry for me. I'm the one that's been offended. She gave this indignant rant in front of the Com Film Festival where she got a standing ovation and where Anthony Bourdain, God bless his blue pill, blue pill white knighting soul, <laughs> her on the head for being so brave and standing up in front of this crowd and, and attacking the Hollywood moguls attacking all the perpetrators, and she is a fucking perp the whole time. Wow. She is a child abuser the whole time. Man, you think Me Too has... Oh, I had an NPR. I was interviewed the other day by NPR, and they asked me if I thought uh, that the Me Too movement had uh, worn out its welcome. And I said, yeah, like the day it started. <laughs> and... and and th it's this stuff. It is this kind of stuff. I mean, and something else that's semi-related here, I'll go on and we'll get to, to Tom's other story, is that there is a woman named Avital Ronell, and she's a professor of German and comparative literature at New York University. She's just been suspended for a year for sexually harassing uh, one of her students. And the feminists have already circled wagons around her, defending her. Now, you have to imagine at a place like NYU, how guilty did this bitch have to be for them to suspend her for a year without pay? She had to be dead. To, well, it turns out her victim was gay. Yep. And he apparently didn't appreciate all the advances and all the threats. And she quit supporting his work when he turned her down. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and she's some sort of her. feminist icon, too. I had never heard of her before, but within ac feminist academic circles, she's like a really big deal. And so now they're circling the wagons around. The hypocrisy in all this stuff, the absolute hypocrisy in Me Too, in this hysteria over sexual abuse and sexual, sexual victimization from people who allege it happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. Oh, and I just now remembered it when Gloria Allred called me. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, and they're still being taken seriously. These people are jokes. They're not victims of anything. There's liars and money grubbers out there trying to make a buck yeah. off of this. So they I mean, ought to be ashamed of themselves. She's going to get her three, $380,000 back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what she had to pay. $380,000, which from, I can guarantee you would not happen from an innocent person. Yeah. I mean, if you're a male, I wouldn't buy paying them off as proof of guilt. But from a woman, you better believe it. From me too to me who, <laughs> you know, who's the me here? Oh, uh, man, it's, 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 it's know, just it's, getting worse. It is literally fascinating to me that these feminists, when they see this woman who is obviously abusive towards this guy, a gay man, when they see that, they drop this whole thing about believe the victim. You know, they're... I mean, that's, that's plastered every place. Believe the victim, believe the victim, believe the victim over and over again. But somehow now they think this is not really fair, what's happening to her. Huh. Well, guess what? It hasn't been fair for about 10,000 to 20,000 men before her, you know? And now you're figuring it out because she's a woman and a feminist. And like, you have to wonder, honestly, who would have paid attention to this guy if he wasn't gay? I mean, it, it's a question that That's deserves to question. be asked. And, and yeah. I think one of the things that comes out of this, too, is you get to see what we've known forever, is that gay men have been embraced by the feminist movement as long as they were willing to be poodles that are walked around and paraded in front of the world as part of the feminist raison d'etre. But huh. the moment they get independent, the moment they think for themselves, people like Rose McGowan and others have thrown them right under the bus. Right. What was it Rose McGowan said? The only thing gay men are good for is uh, wearing orange Speedos and taking Molly at, at gay pride parades. Um, yeah, that's an actual quote from her. Uh, and when, so when gay men don't behave for feminists, when they don't walk, they, they're no good. 
Yeah. And you watch, they're going to try to, this guy's a PhD now. They're going to try to crucify him before it's over with. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy stuff. And of course, as you'll see in the story, and we'll, we'll include this, uh, Tom, I'll send you the link so we can get this in there. His name, the victim's name in this story is out there in both of these stories. In the in the Asia Argento stories, uh, the guy's name is there. The victim's name is there. When the victim is male, it's published. When the alleged victim is female, oh, no, we can't provide her name. That, that would be wrong. Yeah, it's crazy, eh? Misandry in the news. Today. <laughs> yes, indeed. And you got the last one, Tom. Oh, the last one's a zinger. And we usually try or we've been thinking about trying to make the last one positive. And in some ways, we can spin it a little bit to make it positive. But it's quite a story. It's a story about a woman who had been in a DV shelter. And she left. The reason she left was because the woman who was her roommate that night uh, had a penis. That is, it was a trans woman. Thank you, trans woman. And it flipped this person out. And so this big cuffaloo, you know, happens about, you know, how can they have trans women and, and women in the same room and all this stuff. And to me, I just had to smile when I saw that story because, you know, for years, the DV industry has been saying, we cannot allow men into shelters because it would intimidate the women. It would remind them of the abusive situations they faced. It would just on and on about how, no, you can't have men who are volunteers. You can't have men who are workers there. You can't have men who are therapists, only women. And they fill the place up with these women who've been abused before. You know, so they, the whole party line is just easy to promote over and over and over again. So what happens when they have a trans woman? And the feminists have, I guess the feminists have promoted the trans idea, although lately I think they've been a little bit uh, not so hot on it, right, Paul? Oh, apparently not. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, are, there always was the, the TERFs, the, uh, the trans-exclusive radical feminists, um, huh. who wanted to, their, their whole thing is about women born as women. Um, right, but right. Feminism in general has opened itself up to trans politics. And now what they're finding is what I think is interesting here. The really fascinating thing is, is the only thing that I've ever seen overcome gynocentrism is victim politics. Hmm. When you've got the right victim status as in a trans woman, God, that's true. Then you can override the gynocentrism True. of women only shelters yeah and they have to let you in and i hope this becomes let me say this make sure i'm really clear about saying this no. i hope this becomes a weapon gents if you've ever been abused or think you might have been abused and you want to go stay in a shelter please you know grow your beard out Put on your best lumberjack shirt and knit cap and go to the front door of the place and tell them you identify as a woman. <laughs> and you, by God, insist on services. Yes. I'd love to see people wreck those places with this. Because let's be honest, domestic violence shelters are not about addressing domestic violence. Indeed not. They are political tools, just like Tom said. They get everybody in there under the same narrative, the same mentality, and they will tell women, you know, he hit you, didn't he? He said he was going to hit you, didn't he? Because they get the money from, from filling them up. For and they are so virulently, virulently misandric. I think this is a positive story. This is the one example I've ever seen of gynocentrism being shut down. Um, now it's, and shut down on behalf of biologically a man. Yep. Um, 
but all he had to do, and maybe that's really in some twisted way, maybe this is still gynocentrism, Tom. But maybe this is like, well, he said he's a woman. <laughs> so we have to provide services. Yeah. And I, I just hope, I hope, you guys out, you women out there, trans women in the trans community, if you're in abusive relationships, please go to the shelters and demand that yes. they provide services for yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. It's I'm still, this, we're really trying hard to spin this into positive. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a pretty good job, actually. I, I like Yeah, that I worked on it, man. I had to rehearse in my head. You know, how can I spin this shit? The whole idea that, that this is the one thing that can trump the whole uh, gynocentrism piece. I mean, that's just, uh, that's a really good point. And it trumps it in a way that is um, <laughs> backdoorish, can we say? I mean, it's just, um, it's interesting. Well, and it depends on how things go. You know, in Canada right now, they pass laws. If you say you're a woman, you're a woman. That's right. That's they right. Put it on your driver's license. They got to, you know, uh, it is the law. You That's don't why. have to have a history of anything. All you got to do. So listen, all you Canadian activists out there. I mean, Lauren Southern did it to make a point. Yeah. She claimed to identify, uh, that she identified as a man and got her driver's license changed. But what I'm saying is, you guys that are activists in Canada, if, and for all the women-only services they have there, I'm just adding two and two. <laughs> I think you can fuck their shit up with that. I'll tell you what, that is definitely FDSU material. <clears throat> yes, it is. Because that would just completely uh, uh, make it chaos. <laughs> and, yes, and chaos, and there's our spin that's accurate now. Now, that, now we know it's a good story. Because what it did was it opened up an avenue to create chaos in women-only pro programs that we know are just political bullshit. Yeah, uh, it, yep. it isn't like, you know, look, if it's a breast cancer program, I wouldn't want to fuck with it. I don't want right, to right. mess with sick people, that sort of thing. Exactly. But these politically oriented feminist women only shit, man, you guys in Canada could be wrecking balls on that stuff right now. That's you correct. Could dude, show up. Hey, I'm a woman. Let me the fuck in. Yeah. And see how they like that. Yeah. Sports teams, too. You yep. Know, join the women's uh, volleyball team. Oh, wow. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm a woman. And we never did do that uh, one on women's sports, did we? No, we didn't. All the talk that we've had, <laughs> we should do one someday on that. Again, I got tired of oxymorons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we must be about finished. <laughs> We're finished. <laughs> We're about finished, Mr. Elon. I think we're about finished. <laughs> Anyways, that is our four stories in the news that have some element of misandry to all of them, and they all do, and we'll be back next time with four more stories because you know what, folks? There ain't no shortage of this. Maybe I can go to not. headlines any given day and fill out a program card for this show <laughs> with four stories easily. In fact, guys, do that. You know, send it to my Twitter account. Send me a DM, a direct message to my Twitter account with your suggestions about different articles, and uh, we'll have you on too. We'll have a good time. And you can also, uh, where, what is your DM, what is your Twitter account? At, at TR Golden. At TR Golden. At TR and also... If you want to write me an email, you can send one to an ear for men at gmail.com. Uh, if you've got a news story, I've been, matter of fact, the, uh, I've got three different people sent me the Asia Argento story. Um, Is that right? Yeah. Was there, we should have had them on, Paul. Huh? We should have had them on. Uh, I, they, didn't, they didn't express an interest in coming on. They just okay. wanted to send the story, which I appreciate. Yeah. So good. thank you to all of you who sent that to me. Good. And with that, I guess we're done here. We're done, man. Men are good, as are you. Yes, you are. I'll see you guys. Bye. Now let's see if I can figure out how to turn this fucking thing off. Turn the fucking thing off. Yeah.
Okay, 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 okay. All right. I think we're recording, so whenever you're ready. Okay, in three, two. Good mo Don't snicker, Golden. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> three, two. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I am Paul Elam, and this is my good friend Tom Golden from MenAreGood.com. And to the, 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 the. <laughs> three, two, one. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>